Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and as one of the co-organizers of this conference, uh, it's been great to see a whole series of uh, fantastic talks and uh, really top class researchers from all over the world. So I'm happy that we were able to do this. And thank you all for uh, coming here. And then I'll thank myself and the other organizers for inviting me to give this talk. Um, and uh, yeah, as Vinod said, uh, I'm, I go by Vijay. Full name is Vijay Raghavan. So since you guys have been here for a while, you can say this quite easily now. Um, uh, I'm uh, a faculty member at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. Uh, and the work, as you, it's always the case, is mostly done by students and postdocs. So this is, these are my current uh, group members. And uh, it's a whole bunch of people who have gone through the lab, mostly short-term project students uh, in the last about four years or so. Um, <clears throat> So just a quick advertisement and a picture of our current group. Uh, this is the group. Uh, we are uh, in Mumbai. It's a whole uh, kinds of topics we are working on or we are interested in working in in the near future. Uh, my talk today is going to focus on uh, these ultra low noise uh, parametric amplifiers and some, some work we did a little while ago on um, how to enhance some of the properties and then where we would like to take them uh, in the future. Since there seems to be a trend for doing some geography, let me also show you. We are located in Mumbai, which is here on the map of India. We are currently in Bengaluru, which is down here. It's about an hour, 40 minutes flight to Mumbai. Uh, and then in Mumbai, we are actually uh, located all the way at the bottom, right at the water. And that's TIFR. It's a small institute, it's right on the water. It's a nice, beautiful campus. I would welcome you to visit us. Uh, Whenever possible, just drop me an email and we can arrange uh, for things. And as I said, I've been here about a little over four years. So here's an outline of my talk. Uh, I'm going to sort of introduce parametric amplification and apologize to the experts. Uh, I'll do a, uh, I'm going to do some very basic stuff, uh, mostly for the benefit of the students here. Uh, and then I will talk about superconducting parametric amplifiers, which have already been discussed in many talks before, in particular, Michelle. Uh, discuss one particular kind of parametric amplifier while he had pointed out several other designs. I will focus on a different design uh, and will try to connect with some of the other ideas and come back to them towards the end of the talk. Uh, the key, uh, the main part of the talk is going to be uh, discussing this enhancement of amplifier bandwidth. Uh, and I'm going to restrict my discussion to amplifiers which are typically made of one uh, or, or a few resonating modes. Um, there are also uh, been a lot of work in the recent years on amplifiers which rely on nonlinear transmission lines, uh, which offer a lot more bandwidth. Uh, I will, I can say something about those towards the end if you have questions. But I'm going to be restricting the discussion to the to the first set of amplifiers which were made in this community, um, starting about maybe 10 years ago, and uh, they have been really, really successful in um, revolutionizing this field. If I if I can. Uh, say like that. And towards the end, I'll sort of say where we are going uh, with some of these ideas. So starting at a very, very basic level, um, and uh, I find that often this is, uh, especially for students, uh, this is not something which is appreciated. So just to sort of put it in perspective, uh, you know, a very generic amplifier, uh, you can have some input signal. Usually there is some noise associated with the input signal. I won't say right now what this noise is, but Usually there is a noise coming from your input line as well. The amplifier's job is to just take this and give you an amplified version, not just in voltage or current if you're thinking of electrical amplifiers, but there should really be power gain. For example, students might know that a transformer uh, can amplify or increase the voltage at the output uh, or the current, but for, a, for an amplifier we are talking about, we really need power gain so that there is both voltage and current. Those are the kind of amplifiers we'll be uh, dealing with, and that's, these ideas apply to those kind of amplifiers. Now, in addition to just um, creating a, uh, an amplified copy of the input signal and the input noise, in general, an amplifier also adds some additional noise. Now, here's sort of the first odd thing, which when you think about it, it looks strange, because what this means is that, in general, an amplifier actually degrades signal-to-noise ratio because the signal and the noise have been amplified by the same factor, but there is more noise at the output. 
So it kind of seems counterintuitive that why would you put an amplifier? It seems to be degrading the signal to noise ratio uh, compared to the input. And you have to look a little more closely because after the amplifier, this has to go into some detector. You know, this could be uh, your oscilloscope or spectrum analyzer, some analyzing device where you actually record the data. And usually, in fact, almost always, this recording instrument is horrible, it's terrible. It has a lot of noise at its input. So if you sent the input signal directly to this detector, you will see nothing. So what the amplifier does is that this ambient or detector noise, it makes that inconsequential. So whatever the detector property might be, if your amplifier is good and it increases the signal and the noise to a level, including its own added noise, that this stuff is much, much larger than the detector noise, then you're doing a good job. And a good amplifier is one which sort of minimizes this added noise as much as possible and has large enough gain so that the output uh, noise is much larger than this detector noise. So in practice, the situation you have to compare is input signal going directly to the detector versus input signal going to the detector via this interfacing amplifier. And that allows you to really get the best signal to noise ratio in any experiment. So what is this origin of this added noise? And is it possible to make this uh, added noise zero? There are lots of this very nice discussion of these ideas in this uh, review of modern physics by Ash Clark and others. Uh, and I would encourage for those who are interested to uh, the details to look at it. It turns out, of course, depending on what kind of amplifier it is, you can uh, source of extra noise can be anything. But it turns out that even if you go down to the fundamental level, quantum mechanics actually restricts this quantity and says that you have to add a minimum amount of noise. And it sort of comes uh, in a very general way of speaking from Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. You can have the relation for position and momentum, but you can also have a relation for quanta and phase of, say, microwave radiation. And by requiring that the input and the output of an amplifier satisfy certain properties which is expected of those modes, and I think Michelle had mentioned this in his talk and maybe even Ash briefly mentioned it, um, you find out that an amplifier in principle has to or add extra noise for those uh, properties to be valid. So fundamentally it is not possible to have what's called a phase preserving amplification, which is the most general kind of amplification you do in daily life. You, you want a, um, a faithful copy of the signal, which is not uh, distorted in any, in any way. And in that case, you have to add a minimum amount of noise, and this noise is set by uh, quantum mechanics. Now, this field of parametric amplifier, as I was saying, has really completely revolutionized this. And I just wanted to sort of quickly show you, and you already heard several talks here, you know, starting from the observation of quantum jumps, production and detection of squeeze micro light doing quantum feedback, or observing single quantum trajectories. You know, Kato talked about this yesterday and also mentioned a similar experiment like this one. And this is just a very small sample. The, I mean, I as an experimentalist love signal to noise ratio. I mean, you just can't have enough. The more, the better. And I've, I've sort of seen this transition from waiting uh, hours to get a Rabi oscillation trace to seeing it live on your screen. And I think it's just the most beautiful feeling uh, you can have. And essentially, it's, it gives you a much clearer picture of the quantum world. And I think that's uh, what has really changed and, and uh, driven the progress in the field of superconducting quantum information in the, the recent years. So how does this thing work? There was a picture like this in Michelle's talk. I just want to repeat that. In general, the idea is that you have some kind of nonlinear medium. And this is sort of the principle of parametric amplification, which and it's really sort of a minimalistic model and you can understand all the bits and pieces and see what's going on. There is usually a very large pump signal which sort of sets up this nonlinear medium in the right regime for you to do amplification. And then here's the signal you're trying to amplify. And then depending, um, and then this nonlinear process creates interactions between these signal and pump photons. And then at the output, you get an amplified version of the signal. Uh, the pump is assumed to be almost undisturbed. This is what is also called as the uh, stiff pump approximation. And then you have another copy, the idler, which actually comes out as a necessary requirement, and it's closely connected to this idea of added noise. 
And then depending on the kind of nonlinearity you have in your medium, you can have several situations. These are sort of two typical uh, situations where either the omega pump can, is equal to signal plus idler. This, for example, is the situation in the JPC where you pump at the sum of the signal and idler frequencies. Or you can also have a situation like this where omega signal plus omega idler is twice the pump frequency. So one is called degenerate, another is called non-degenerate, and then there are also few variations which Michelle had also mentioned called doubly degenerate so far. But essentially the idea is the pump gives you the energy to do the amplification. Okay. If you want, want to implement this using circuits, one of the simplest way to do is to make nonlinear resonators. And the non the nonlinearity can come from uh, various mechanisms. Um, the circuit I'm going to discuss in detail is actually going to come next, but this is actually a slightly simpler uh, thing to understand because we have, all, we have probably seen this in a different context earlier. You have uh, a fabry perot type cavity with a moving mirror, and you know, Ash had introduced these kind of systems in the context of optomechanics, but here this moving mirror is not a mechanical mode which is oscillating at very low frequency. I'm just using this as a way to modulate the resonant frequency of this cavity at twice the uh, resonant frequency. And when you do that, you basically get parametric amplification. So any input signal which is in the vicinity of the cavity resonance gets reflected with gain. And this can be, this is not really, uh, the effect is not really quantum mechanical. The dynamics of the system can be, understand, uh, can be understood completely classically. And I'll sort of go through that just in a little bit. The electrical version of this can some, look something like this. For example, you have a transmission line uh, resonator, which is basically the equivalent of the fabry perot and you use a squid as a tunable boundary condition. And yesterday, uh, Patrice talked about a version of this kind of amplifiers, and then you use a magnetic flux to modulate the resonant frequency. Uh, these kind of amplifiers have been around for some time, and you know, there was one work done in the group of uh, John Martinez, who was earlier at UCSB, now at Google, and then also the Sucklake group uses something similar, but there have been several other uh, implementations of this type. Okay. So sort of very simply what you have is uh, harmonically, uh, is you have the equation of a uh, damped driven oscillator, but now the drive, the pump drive, is basically goes in here. It modulates the resonant frequency of your harmonic oscillator at a frequency around twice its resonant frequency. And when you do that, and this, this is basically the pump condition that your omega pump is twice the resonant frequency uh, of the resonator, and your signal frequency, which is coming from here, is near the uh, resonant frequency as well. Now, when you uh, look at this equation, you see there are terms uh, which are sort of product of this pump and, and, the, and the response of your, your oscillator, you're going to get mixing. And this results in response of this oscillator, which is at both the drive frequency, which is the sorry, signal frequency, omega s, but also at this difference frequency, omega p minus omega s. And this is basically your idler tone. And your general response of uh, the oscillator can be written like this. And I would really encourage the students to go home and actually just write this down. You assume a solution of this form, a steady state solution. This is sort of an extension of the kind of calculations you have done for solving the harmonic oscillator. You just plug this in, look for a steady state. It's slightly more ca complicated mathematically, but you will actually see that you can compute everything you want by just plugging in these forms uh, into the thing and then throwing away higher order terms uh, which are not resonant with your cavity. And again, the idea is that the energy is coming from the pump, but to emphasize, we work in a regime, uh, and these calculations are done in a regime where you assume that the pump is just so much stronger than everything else, the, it basically doesn't change, even though you're drawing energy from that, from that source. Now, it turns out that you actually don't need to do this modulation in this way. There is other ways you can do this modulation. And this can be done by using just the Kerr nonlinearity of the system. Just to point out, remember that I started with the equation of a harmonic oscillator. There was no nonlinear term in the oscillator. Here, the nonlinearity is parametric. The fact that you can change the resonant frequency, that is a form of nonlinearity. A system has to allow to do that. So in the example, the fabry perot you can move the mirror. And in the electrical example, the squid allows you to do that. But here, you, have, uh, you can use basically the intrinsic Kerr nonlinearity of a Josephson junction-based oscillator. So you can just have a very simple circuit 
um, the Josephson junction, you can put into the squid if you want to tune the frequencies, and you create a nonlinear oscillator. And this is sort of really uh, the problem of a driven pendulum. And I think Ash had also mentioned this. You go to the 1950s, Landau Lifshit, you find solutions for this uh, equation, and you get these kind of steady state response curves for these oscillators. These are essentially response versus frequency for different driving amplitudes. So at low amplitudes, you have Lorentzian type response, and as you increase, you get this sort of bending to lower frequencies, and then for certain values, you can have multiple stable states. The parametric amplification regime happens very near, for example, this red curve before the onset of this bistability. Uh, right in that region, the system behaves like a parametric amplifier, and I'll connect that to what we just um, discussed in the previous slides. This is just the phase response of the oscillations. Uh, it's the same data shown in phase. So now you actually have a nonlinear oscillator. So you have a Kerr term here uh, in your oscillator. And then now the pump is directly driving the resonator. It's not parametrically modulating anything. It's directly driving the resonator. So now you can say that, well, in the presence of this drive, I can have a steady state response, which could look like this. You would expect to lowest order that the, the system will respond at the drive frequency you're doing. This is an approximation. It works pretty well. The drives are not too strong. And again, as an exercise, I would say that just go home, plug this in, and see what happens. You know, you'll get a mess of uh, things. But if you play around with it, you will actually get the equations of motion which will allow you to compute the curves I showed you in the previous graph. Now, what we want to do is we want to take this equation, and along with this pump, we want to now add the signal we want to amplify, which is uh, going to be much, much weaker than the pump, uh, the pump signal. And in that case, we can actually expand the solution in this form. We say that, okay, the solution, since the pump is the dominant term, I'm going to assume that the original solution exists the same way. And I'm going to now have a small extra term, y of t, which is the dynamics I'm interested in, because I'm interested in what happens to the signal. Okay? And then if you expand, you plug this back in, and you expand it for small y, essentially keeping only terms uh, uh, up to a harmonic oscillator, you again get an equation of a driven damped oscillator. But now, this nonlinear term, when you have uh, this omega pump, it gives you an effective pump frequency. So, this uh, driven Kerr nonlinear oscillator is mapped back to the parametrically driven effective harmonic oscillator. So, so this equation for y basically is the same equation I showed you yesterday. There is one important difference is that in this case, this omega zero effective, because this omega zero is also renormalized, this is the effective frequency of this new harmonic oscillator, and that's never equal to omega pump. So you never reach this exact resonance condition, which is possible in the general case of parametric pumping. Now, that doesn't prevent you from uh, getting parametric amplification, but it has some consequences. And if people are interested, I can say something about that towards the end. Okay. So how do you use this as an amplifier? You have your resonator. You use this device called a circulator to send in and separate input and uh, reflected signals. You send in your pump signal that sets up the nonlinear resonator in the right operating point and, of course, just reflects back. So at the output, you do get the pump as well. Then you send in your weak signal tone that goes and interacts now with, and reflects back with gain. And also, you create this idler term, which is now at 2 omega p minus omega. So this case where the pump frequencies and the signal and the idler frequencies are all close to each other, this is called the doubly degenerate mode of parametric amplification. And now this distinction between phase preserving and phase sensitive, if omega s is different than omega p, and it's very narrow band signal, so that you can separate the signal and idler in frequency space, then it's a phase preserving amplifier. But if you have omega s the same as omega p, then the relative phase of the omega s and omega p signals matters. And then you can get phase sensitive amplification and can control that. And I think uh, we saw that uh, yesterday in several talks, which exploits that mode. So this amplifier allows both modes of operation. It's naturally suited to phase sensitive amplification, but you can also do phase preserving by only having narrow band signals, uh, which are far from the pump. And in all of these amplifiers, the noise, the extra noise, just comes from the fact that even if you're not sending in any signal at the idler frequency, there are always quantum fluctuations. And that's sort of the ultimate limit. This quantum fluctuations in the idler mode gets amplified 
and comes back into your signal mode and gives you the extra noise. And in the most ideal case where everything is working, both of these contributions are equal. Your signal mode has half a photon of noise. That gets amplified to the output. And the idler mode gives you an extra half photon. So the total noise at the output is one photon worth of noise multiplied by the gain, of course. But you get this extra factor. And that's sort of quantum limit. And these devices really allow you, by keeping the dynamics very simple, controlling the number of modes uh, in a careful way, you really sort of reach this regime. And you can make them operate at the close to the quantum limit. So that was sort of the introduction to this basic uh, functioning of parametric amplifiers. Now I would like to talk about this idea we came up with a couple of years back on how to sort of go beyond this uh, gain bandwidth product, which was also discussed um, in a few talks earlier. What this says that because of you can change the gain of this amplifiers by changing the pumping condition, um, but when you increase the gain, the consequence you get is that the bandwidth narrows. This is just sort of comes from these equations. You can't do anything else to beat that if you only have a single mode oscillator. So what I'm showing here is that as the gain increases, the bandwidth decreases as we go from a voltage gain of say 2 to 10. So this gain times bandwidth is a constant. And this constant is given by how strongly this oscillator is coupled to the environment. So the natural kappa, the linear kappa of the uh, oscillator is basically is what sets this constant. So the most natural approach to increase bandwidth is that, well, let's increase this constant so that I can have larger bandwidth for the same gain. So, and this kappa is essentially controlled by this uh, coupling to the environment. And you can do that by introducing some kind of an impedance transformer and make it more strongly coupled to the environment. Typically in uh, a superconducting circuits, since it's at microwave, it's all 50 ohms. So you don't really have too much freedom, but, but using impedance transformers, you can do that. The problem is that there is actually a limit to how strongly you can do this, how far you can do this. As you make the kappa larger and larger, you have to pump the system stronger and stronger to get large gain. And at some point, this pendulum starts to, is oscillating with the really large amplitude. The higher order terms comes in. I only sort of showed you the first nonlinear term. And then basically things go bad. And your pendulum can start rotating, and it will basically become unstable, it'll give you extra noise. You might still see some gain. It doesn't work. So you can't decrease, increase your damping beyond a certain point. So what we were looking at is that, is there some way it sort of doesn't change this damping, but still gives you more bandwidth? Okay. And the idea goes like this. We have the same circuit. We're just going to now introduce a small reactance in the circuit in this position. And the idea is that the value of this reactance is 0 at the pump frequency. So I'm sort of switching terminologies. Omega d is omega drive, same as omega pump. Apologize for that. Um, that's just sort of condition we set. So that way we know that at the pump frequency, the gain is undisturbed. But then what we do is we introduce uh, in this x of omega a function like this. Basically, we have a linear slope uh, on this reactance as you go away from the pump frequency. So this is detuning from the pump frequency in units of the kappa. And when you do that, you basically see that this gain remains constant at the center point, but then this profile essentially goes up. And for an optimal slope, you can get a curve like this, which is very flat, and then rolls off. It'll be sort of interesting to see that we actually discovered this effect empirically while messing around with numerical simulations. Um, it's sort of, there are all these nice tools out there, and you can mess around, and it was, uh, again, motivated by previous work from John Martinez group, and we found that it's extremely simple to do this. And what kind of circuit gives you a linear slope like this? It's just a simple series LC circuit. You tune the resonant frequency of that to match the drive, so that makes, gives you zero reactance at that frequency. And then the slope is just controlled by the ratio of L to C. And in, what we find is that the enhancement of the bandwidth basically depends on the gain. So goes as square root of gain. So it's a modest enhancement, but it, it really works. So uh, we approached uh, Arsh Clerk. We said, well, we see this effect. We think it works, but we don't really understand what's going on. So Arsh uh, did some math, and he said, oh, this is very easy. It's all about self-energies. Um, <laughs> so now we go to the Hamiltonian picture. You've seen different versions of that. This is the doubly degenerate uh, uh, case. 
A1 and A2 represent the signal and IDRA modes, even though they are not physically separate modes, they are two different frequency modes, so you can do that. This frequency, uh, this term here, uh, gives you the nonlinear interaction, and that's the pump strength, and this omega d is the detuning I told you about, that the pump is never in resonance for this kind of an amplifier. And then you go, and what you really need to do, solve the dynamics of uh, the oscillator, is compute the susceptibility matrix. This is just the quantum mechanical version of the classical calculation. I presented some slides ago, okay? And this susceptibility matrix looks like this, and there's uh, your favorite self-energy terms here, the sigma one and sigma two, and these actually have a very physical meaning in this, uh, and a simple physical meaning is that they are actually just related to the input impedance, uh, input, input admittance, the real and imaginary parts, sorry, the input admittance at the signal and the idler frequencies, this sigma one and sigma two. And when we introduce this reactance, that's what we are changing. We're changing what the parametric amplifier is seeing in its environment. Okay. So you go ahead and solve for this, and you see that there is this leading order omega dependence in, the, um, in, this, uh, in this susceptibility matrix. The gain is just given by uh, this expression. And again, uh, this comes from just doing the input-output theory, uh, which was also discussed in many slides. You can compute the signal gain and the idler gain. And the thing you have to notice is that this omega dependence is what's giving you the roll off of the gain. And that's sort of a linear dependence. So if somehow you could make this sigma one the right uh, quantity that it cancels this omega, then basically the uh, uh, frequency dependence completely goes away. So what you need ideally is that the real part of this uh, input admittance is just one over R. The imaginary part just goes uh, linearly like this, and um, this is just the same thing represented in terms of the input impedance, because in the earlier discussions I was talking about impedance and not admittance, it's just easier to see it in admittance. Now, of course, you can't do this for arbitrarily large frequencies. You can't have this linear dependence go on forever. So what we have been able to achieve is sort of the first step in approaching that limit. So your gain is really some complicated uh, function of frequency, you can expand it in higher orders, and when you do this correct uh, uh, series LC circuit with the right impedance, essentially what you're doing is you're canceling out this first leading order term, and that makes your gain sort of go from a Lorenzian type of profile to something which looks as um, uh, a flat top here. So how does the device look like? Um, we had several iterations. You saw something like this in Cater's talk as well. This is essentially a hybrid which con con uh, converts single-ended signals to differential signals. This was an earlier design we were working with. We saw that, okay, we have to introduce impedance transformers, but this was already an impedance transformer, so we just messed around with the uh, dimensions of these things and made it just right. So there is a slightly fatter section here, and there are these fat sections. Turned out that without changing much to our design, we could get this impedance transformer working. This was the first generation. Then we moved to a more coplanar waveguide kind of geometry and then introduced a lambda over four transformer, which allows you us to increase the damping a little bit. It turns out that having slightly larger kappa helps in, in the design of the, uh, the reactance part. And the imaginary part is controlled by a lambda over two transformers. So these are just geometric ways of implementing the same technique I showed you with lump circuits turns out to be much easier. The really amazing thing is that this chip at the end is the original paramp. It's the same device. But by just carefully tailoring the environment, we were able to make this amplifier work uh, with a much, much larger bandwidth. So here is the result. You have this really nice broadband gain going uh, from this plus minus from the pump frequency of about 640 megahertz. Typically, these devices used to have at best around 50 megahertz of bandwidth in a typical scenario, in many cases even less. So this was a significant improvement. We also measured the noise to see how much added noise it was uh, putting, and essentially there was no degradation. And of course, it also comes from the theory that it really doesn't change anything about how the amplifier operates, uh, so there is no reason why you should have excess noise, unless, of course, you're introducing some higher order processes. And this here is essentially the, what we call the 1 dB compression point. It's the power you send in at which your gain starts to drop by 1 dB, and that's an important quantity because if you're making a broadband amplifier, it should also be able to handle a lot of signal, and I will comment on that towards the end of the talk. Okay. Um, 
Another thing is that, you know, you assume your environment is a night flat 50 ohms, but it never is. Typically, the environment actually has ripples in it. And it turns out that this trick of impedance engineering actually allows us to work around it. And this data we took, uh, which is also there in this paper, is just plotting this gain as a function of signal frequency for different pump frequencies. It turns out that if you position your pump just right, these modulations, if they're sort of symmetric, they can cancel each other out. So even though your environment is not very flat, you can actually get a very flat gain, as I showed in the previous slide. Um, you see there are only very small ripples, except for a large one at the end. And that basically tells you that the cancellation is happening really nicely here, but not so nicely over the end. And this was sort of a nice trick that it's a practical thing that you can actually, just by slightly tuning your pump frequencies, you can make the, the amplifier look quite flat in previous space. Okay. Now one can say, well, how do we uh, go further. Well, this was sort of the first attempt. This is the idealized linear response, uh, linear function we want, which we, of course, in practice can never have. But, and this was the, the, this is what we have made with a single LC circuit, and that gives you a gain profile like that. Now, you can add more complicated circuits to your environment to change how this Y of in uh, behaves. So now you can make it closer to this idealized line. You can increase the bandwidth here. Here, in these two things, we constrain that we want a flat top response. But if you relax that, you can actually do many more things. If you allow a little bit of ripple by adding many, many more resonant modes, you can actually get a lot of bandwidth as well. So I think ultimately, the kappa, the linear kappa, is going to limit you. You can't go uh, beyond that. And we are exploring how to uh, build these kind of more complicated circuits to uh, increase the bandwidth. Now, is this idea very specific? I showed you the calculation for our design. It turns out that actually it's a very generic idea. And that can be seen by looking at this whole process in a different way. So we, do, we use this direct pumping parallel LC circuit, but this flux pump param, which Patrice talked about yesterday, and we're also working on a series array param with Nicola, essentially exploiting their excellent uh, technology for making large array of junctions to build an amplifier which looks like a series LC circuit rather than a parallel LC circuit. But as long as they are all parametric amplifiers, you can actually think of them in a slightly different way, and it's well known, that these are called negative resistance amplifiers. All of these amplifiers work in reflection. So this pumped nonlinear oscillator can be just thought of as an impedance which has a negative real part and some imaginary part, both of them function of frequency. Now, if you now think about this, what this amplifier is doing, you're reflecting a signal of this negative resistance, and the reflection coefficient is just given by this formula. Now, whenever Z has a negative real part, gamma can be greater than one. That's what gain means. So it's the mismatch of the real part from the 50 ohm line you have that gives you gain. And the imaginary part just messes you up. You want to basically get rid of this imaginary part. And this entire technique is about introducing the correct reactants to cancel this intrinsic reactance of this negative impedance. This is, goes back to the very standard thing we learn in uh, power matching for a source to a load that Z has to be equal to Z star. This is here, you don't want to make the real parts the same because it's the mismatch from the real part gives you the gain, and, but you want to get rid of the imaginary part. So now, thinking in this way, all parametric amplifiers which work in reflection are negative resistance amplifiers. So we should be able to find out what this x of omega is, and then put in the appropriate thing. So it will directly work with this, and we have actually done calculations to see that this works, and right now we are preparing for an experiment uh, with the sample uh, Nicola provided us to see if we can enhance the bandwidth of this amplifiers. What about two port amplifiers, like the JPC Michelle had introduced? They have two physical ports. Does it really change the situation? No. Basically, from both ports, it's a negative resistance amplifier. So now you have to put an impedance transformer or a reactance on both the ports and get both of them right. So it's slightly more complicated that you need more elements, but it works exactly in the same way because they are also just negative resistance amplifiers seen from the perspective of each port. So we, um, this is sort of work in progress, but we are able to do some very simple uh, simulations uh, using uh, nonlinear um, simulators and we can see that you get exactly the same kind of effect. These black traces are without the impedance transformation, and the blue and the red for the signal and the idler, we are basically uh, 
using that um, the limit where the gain is flat. So we have just started making a device um, which uh, implements this. It's slightly more subtle. You have to get uh, various parameters uh, just right, and only then we'll be able to do it. But we're sort of looking forward to doing that. All of these different amplifiers, you know, the, even though their operating principle is the same, depending on the application, they can have uh, really um, useful. And having a JPC with a lot more bandwidth, and we think getting something like 200 megahertz is uh, going to be fairly straightforward. Uh, but you know, ask me maybe in a few months. Um, the JPC currently is typically 10 to 20 megahertz. It's a commercial version which sells, uh, and that has about 10 to 20 megahertz. So a factor of 10 improvement would really be useful for these devices. So um, I basically uh, would like to end my talk there. I showed you this new, very simple impedance engineering technique to increase the bandwidth of uh, single mode uh, parametric amplifiers, and we were able to get 640 megahertz. We have ideas on how to improve it further. And Using this, there are many, many things we would like to do. Some of them are ongoing, some in the near future. Of course, we would like to test this multipole designs. But even before we do that, we really need to improve this idea of saturation. I'm still using the same single junction, and essentially it doesn't, it basically gives up after some point of time. You're, what you're doing by this impedance engineering technique is you're allowing the signals to couple a lot more effectively to your uh, nonlinear resonator but it just cannot handle these signals. And that's one of the limiting things. And there are many ideas out there for, uh, for improving this saturation by using arrays of Josephson junctions. And I think Sham has a poster outside uh, for the JPC, the snail design. And then by uh, using that, they can also go to arrays of snails to improve uh, the saturation. But it's turning out to be somewhat of a tricky problem. You know, people have been working on it now for close to eight years or so, but not very seriously. It's sort of a side project in every group. Um, it really hasn't delivered, but we hope to uh, do something about that in the near future. And then, of course, you want to combine this high saturation with the broadband design because just the vacuum fluctuations can saturate your amplifier. Okay. And then the experimental tests of this series uh, paramp and the JPC design we are working on. And from the application point of view, when it's a broadband amplifier, you can straight away use it for multiplexed, multi qubit readout if that's something you would like to do. We are working on uh, doing photon correlation measurements, exploiting this very large bandwidth we have to collect photons from a, uh, a two-level emitter, which is a lot more strongly coupled to the environment. Uh, you saw a talk by Simone where their coupling to the environment was only about two megahertz. We can go uh, a lot higher uh, with the help of these amplifiers. In fact, we had a nice discussion where he was telling us about the subtleties of these uh, correlation measurements. And this work is being done by Nicola, who is visiting from Nicola's group to our lab. Uh, and then, the fact that you have a very broad band means that it has a very fast response time. So if for some applications, you really need to do a, your measurement really, really quickly uh, in the circuit QED architecture. You also need a fast amplifier. And I know that the group of Andreas Walroff is also trying to uh, implement this very fast readout, because especially any experiment involving feedback, you would like to finish your measurement as quickly as possible. There are, of course, other problems in circuit QED which prevent you from doing that. So these kind of amplifiers, especially the phase-sensitive ones, can allow you to uh, do that quite nicely. Okay, so with that, I'll end my talk and take any questions. Yes, um, so the, um, the question is about phase-sensitive amplifiers. We have not been uh, working on sort of looking at the squeeze radiation and things like that, but you can measure the gain as a function of the relative phase between the signal and the pump and you see the variation as you go 90 degrees off. And, and there were a couple of talks uh, which also showed that, and that works uh, just fine in this case. Uh, so in your negative resistance circuit, you said it was the impedance at the pump frequency. Is there a reason you don't say it at the signal frequency? Sorry? Over here, you say R sub P. Is that you? By P, you mean pump uh, frequency? No, no. What I by, by mean R P is this is the pumped uh, negative resistant, uh, which is coming from the pumped system. The it's, pumped system. It, it, that's so omega is basically detuning from the pump. Detuning from the pump. Okay. So you uh, you basically solve for the effective. You know, basically can convert gamma, which is what you can compute anyway, which is gain, yep. back into a, 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 an impedance by this inverting this formula. And you just sort of throw the pump out of the problem. So you say that this is an effective nonlinear element, and it looks like this in frequency space. 
So what, what about flux pumping one of these amplifiers? What changes, it, the, the still approaches still work if you were gonna try to do a flux, flux pump? It's exactly the same. As I said, um, I can, instead of sending in my pump and resonantly driving it, I can use a two omega pump here. It still looks like a negative resistance amplifier. What I, we have sort of some evidence from simulations that the exact frequency dependence and the form of the negative impedance changes a little bit, but it's still uh, just a negative resistance amplifier. Also, I showed you that these two systems, when you solve for the equations, ultimately go to that of a parametrically modulated harmonic oscillator. So there is absolutely no difference uh, in this. So the same, so what might not happen, for example, is that the same impedance transformer might not work for both the flux pumped and the direct pump, but you'll have to make it slightly different. It won't be significantly different. We ex all of these tests we have done, the basic idea of having a linear slope in the imaginary part works just fine. 